Well, good morning, everyone. This is Rick Wycheck, the director of NIHS. Uh, welcome all of you back to the 162nd meeting of the National Advisory Environmental Health Sciences Council. So we will again be together for several hours and we're going to kick things off this morning with a few presentations, uh, but I'm gonna turn the virtual podium over to our uh, deputy director of DERT, Pat Maston. So take it away. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, as is our custom for um, just about every council uh, meeting we have, we like to give a DERT update. Um, uh, and if John can pull up my slide here, let me see if I can take control of it. Yep. Um, nope, I can't. There we go. Um, today we're gonna to do it a little bit differently. It's gonna be a bit of a tag team. I'll be starting off and going over some business things and that sort of thing related to um, the ERT. And then uh, our new acting director, uh, Dr. Gary Ellison will pick up the second half of the talk to introduce himself and to talk a little bit about his thoughts related to his experience and coming here to DERT. So here are some of the things we'll be chatting about today. I'll give you some staffing updates. I'll talk about something called council, council delegated authorities. Um, I'll give you a budget wrap up for FY 2020 uh, budget. Talk some about the funding opportunities that are going on now in the FY 2021 talk about a few things under the rubric of uh, DIRT activities. And then I'll spend a few minutes talking about a couple of items that are kind of a holdover from our September council where we had a theme related to racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Then I will turn it over to Gary to, uh, to introduce himself and to take you through the rest of the talk. So we always like to do our uh, introduce and you know, welcome our new staff members. And we have um, three people we wanna to introduce today. The first two I'm gonna talk about are Grants management specialists, these are the folks that work in the grants management branch. That's the group of people that uh, process, work up the awards, make the awards, and do it all according to policy and regulation, keep us all out of trouble. So a uh, very important job to have. And we have two that we are uh, welcoming today. Both have experience with grants uh, before coming on board, so that's certainly a, a plus. The first one I'd like to introduce is Latavia Miller. Latavia comes to us from the USDA, where she was uh, associated with the Animal Plant Inspection Service and the Farm Production and Conservation Service. Like I say, she has four years of grant experience and um, we certainly welcome her experience here. And Latavia, we welcome you on board the DERT. And um, second, oops, yeah, secondly is uh, Camille Asuncion, who um, comes to us from the Army. He was most recently with the Army Research Office in uh, RTP here. Prior to that, he was with the Research Laboratory up in Delphi, Maryland. And prior to that, he's, he was a veteran, he's a veteran of the U.S. Uh, Air Force, and you can see where he was deployed, and we appreciate his service during that time, of course. We're very lucky to have both of these folks joining us now to help us with the, uh, the large grants management workload that we typically have uh, starting about this time of year. We're also uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Jackie Marzek. Jackie comes to us from the uh, intramural division here, actually. She'll be working in the um, excuse me, exposure response and technology branch, which is David Balshaw's branch in DRT. After 20 years in DIR, working in <coughs> Steve Kleberger's lab, dealing with immunity inflammation and laboratory work, uh, disease laboratory. Um, she'll be working primarily with Sri Nadador on the Counteract program, which you heard about during Sri's presentation yesterday. So welcome Jackie and, and thank you for joining us. So not all of our um, staff changes are uh, all, fully great news. We say goodbye to a good friend, uh, Janice Allen, who retired in December. Janice was with the Scientific Review Branch for um, like 18 years. Um, before that, she was an intramural chemist at uh, NIDDK and NIDCR. And right before she came to us back in the early 2000s, she was with the veterinary school at NC State. Janice um, is quite an, was quite an asset. She knows, knew the science, and more importantly for an SR, she knew the people who knew the science. She knew how to run a meeting. She knew how to do summary statements. And she is just, a, was just an absolute pleasure to work with. Um, I speak, um, I think I speak for the entire division when I say that we're losing not only a colleague, but a good friend here. And we hope she will stay close, but we also hope she will enjoy her retirement. All right, so I need to talk to something about council delegated authorities. For those of you who haven't heard this spiel before, either from Gwen or from me, it basically is this. 
<clears throat> for any uh, award that we make, we have to have a council concurrence uh, for almost everything. Some of these are fairly small, nitpicky little items. So if we have to make a, an award to change someone's institution or change the PI, um, if the grant stays at the institution or for uh, assigning an interim PI for whatever reason, or for giving extensions of funds with, extension of grants with or without funds. These are ordinary day-to-day -day things that we don't have, want to have to bring to council to adjudicate uh, on a regular basis. So what we do is we ask you to delegate the authority to do these back to us so we can just do them. Um, you should have received, oops, you should have received a document in your electronic council book, which is a page or two outlining some of these um, authorities that we would like for you to delegate to us. There are no changes from last time. The last big uh, revamping we did of this was maybe two years ago, but like I say, last year's is the same as this year's, but we still need a vote to approve these council delegated authorities. So I'm gonna stop right here and ask if there are any questions before I ask for a, uh, a uh, motion to approve. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and let me know. Otherwise, I will accept a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Okay, thank you, Terry. And a second? Second. Second, great. If you could then uh, vote in the electronic council book, uh, we, just like you did yesterday, we would appreciate it and then we can move on. And Liz, you will let me know when we've, uh, everyone has voted. I will say while you're all voting, I, I kind of missed a note to myself here when I was back at these the staff changes. Uh, Rick mentioned yesterday two big staff changes. One was, of course, uh, Chip Hughes moving on to another, to OSHA. Certainly a big loss for us, but we're also very happy to have Sharon Beard step in uh, to take his place. Um, as an acting uh, branch chief. She's certainly experienced and we feel very confident that we can keep the, the smooth transition going. Um, Liz, are we there yet? I can't see. Okay, great. Thank you all. So let's move on now. Um, so like I say, um, in February, we like to do a, a budget wrap up. You know, our uh, fiscal year runs from October 1st to September 30th. So this is the first council round we have after the close of, of the previous fiscal year. So we'd like to give you a little bit of information, not too detailed, but just to give you a sense of the, um, how we spent your money last year and to do that. So um, here are just, I don't know, some factoids related to some of the spending we did in FY 2020. We had um, 1,533 applications reviewed either by our um, scientific review staff here or by um, the Center for Scientific Review in, um, up in Bethesda. Of these 1,500 applications, we um, awarded 294 competing applications. A competing application is one that is either new or is a renewal of an existing one that, that has to go through a peer review through a study section. Uh, those are considered competing. This opposed to non-competing grants, which are ones that are in the second, third, fourth, uh, year of the grant, what we call the out years, which do not have to go through a, uh, a review. And you can see the breakdown here, we funded 170 research project grants or RPGs, 50 from our other research, 38 from our small business and 30 for our training grants, and then six centers. And then just focusing a little bit on the um, RPG line here, you can see the average cost for a competing RPG was about $414,000. And for non-competing, about 457,000. Um, we maintained a pay line of 10%. We considered lowering it and decided not to. And this resulted in a pay line of about 14% for both overall RPGs as well as our, our specific R1s. So what I'm showing you here is the overall gestalt of the um, extramural grant expenditure uh, for FY 2020. This excludes the super fund spending, which I'll address later, uh, or the taps that NIH takes from our, uh, our budget. You can see overall, we spent about $387 million. And it breaks down like this. About three quarters of that was to our uh, research project or RPG line to the tune of about 274 million. Our second largest wedge here are our research centers. 
uh, these primarily are in uh, EHS core centers, which is about 11% or $40 million. And these other three wedges represent our training, small business, and other research um, programs. And you can see the five, five, and seven percent respectively, and you can see the dollar amounts over here. Okay. What I'm going to do now is to focus on this blue wedge, the RPGs. I'm going to expand this wedge here to be this entire circle here. So of all these, um, uh, the RPGs that we funded, about, again, three quarters were, were R01s to just over $200 million. Our next biggest expenditure in this area were the R21s, which represented about 21 million. Then our UO1s, which are cooperative agreements, and then our R35s, these are the uh, river grants, which you heard about last round. And then a variety of other things that you can see over here that rounded out the rest of the, of the uh, RPG uh, program. I'm next going to show you, uh, st staying, with the, oops, staying with the research project grants, I'm going to look now at competing versus non-competing. I, I, as I mentioned before, competing are new grants or grants that are being renewed versus non-competing, which are in their out years. And you can see just less than three quarters of what we pay we are being paid to our non-competing or out year um, grants. And just over a quarter are, are competing. And you remember, I showed you this 170 number a couple of slides ago. Of these 170, 45 of these are solicited, 125 are unsolicited. Uh, solicited grants, of course, are ones that are submitted in response to a funding announcement that has a set aside typically an RFA. And the unsolicited are ones which we call also call investigator initiated grants, which are uh, just good ideas that a PI submits and we fund if it receives a good score. I'm gonna focus in a little bit now on these uh, solicited grants here and show you some of the programs, our solicited programs that we funded in, um, in FY 2020. I'm not gonna go through each one of these in detail, just to hit some highlights. Um, here's the river program we funded. This was presented as a concept at September Council by uh, Jenny Collins. Um, I want to mention our pregnancy is a vulnerable time period for women's health. This is a an, kind of a unique program. We have done a fair amount of research over the years in how environmental agents uh, can affect pregnancy, but we often look at the the uh, offspring or the reproductive outcomes. This focuses on the mother themselves and the health effects related to pregnancy and with the influence of environmental. Uh, exposure. So this is a little bit different approach. We uh, launched a new program, another omics program, looking at the functional RNA modifications for environmental disease, our so-called framed program. And then we participated in two um, international programs, one with China and one with Brazil, where we funded four grants between the two of them. Um, so now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about how FY2020 compared to previous years. So you see in this slide, um, we have FY2018, 2019, and 2020, focusing on, again, competing research project grants. And this includes both solicited and unsolicited. You can see that in 2018, um, we funded about 191 applications for a total of around 71 million. That number dropped to 151 in 2019 and a total of 62 million. This is based mostly as a result of uh, the $9 million investment we made in our HERE exposure analysis program. We uh, had to take the money from the RPG line and put it in what's called the other research line to fund those. So the money's still there, it's just being used for a different purpose. And you can see there's still a little bit of a deficit here in 2020, although our numbers are a little bit higher. We got a bit of a bump last year for our grant line, and so that's reflected here. So now I'm going to focus on the unsolicited part of our RPG portfolio. And again, this is the larger part um, of, of the RPG line. And again, you see we have uh, around 130, 140 in um, FY 2018, with the drop in 2019 as we uh, moved our investment over to the HERE program. And then we started to build it back up a little bit in FY 2020. Our pay line stayed fairly constant, went up a little bit last year. But you can see a lot of um, the money that was moved came from what we call our special pay or raise to pay line. These are applications that are above our 10% pay line, but we think are programmatically relevant and we uh, push them to, to, go ahead, to go ahead and pay them. And this slide is one we I think we show every year, which kind of shows long range 
how our um, success rate for our RPGs have done over time. You can see back and during the doubling for those of us who have been at NIH for a while, we did have an increase in the um, success rate, which unfortunately went back down after the doubling ended. It went back up at, at a peak here during the era stimulus days and then came with some kind of going drifting down since. We track fairly constantly with the um, NIH, although we do run about four to five percent lower for our uh, success rates. Okay, up to this point, I've been focusing primarily on the RPG line, which is the blue here. I'm going to focus on these other areas for a few minutes here. You can see, as I mentioned before, our research centers are a fairly substantial investment. These are our um, environmental health science core centers. Um, as well last year as paying some non-competing out years for our environmental health disparity centers, bringing it to that size. Um, our training wedge here, this orange brown color represents both of our fellowship, individual fellowships as well as our institutional uh, training grants, T32s. And um, this blue green teal color is, uh, represents our small business investment. We have a, uh, required amount we have to spend every year uh, in this area. And this represents our SBIRs and our STTRs. This other research wedge is kind of an interesting one. It includes all of our uh, career or K awards. That's our KL1s, our K99s, et cetera. But it also includes a number of what we call other grants uh, types. So um, the HERE grants, these U2Cs are being HERE, um, our cohort uh, maintenance grants for, were also in here as well as our conferences and some of our trainings uh, grants are all, uh, I'm sorry, educational grants are included in here. I'll come back to these R25s a couple of times uh, further down. As I say, I've been focusing on uh, non-superfund, what we call our direct DERT allocation. We do have two superfund programs that I'm gonna kind of take you through quickly here. One is our, our worker training program which is about 26, was about 26 and a half million last year. You can see that the lion's share of the money went to our specialized U45 uh, training center grants with a small wedge here for small business grants. This is our e-learning program. This is to stimulate the development of um, e remote learning tools uh, so for remote learning. Um, this does not include a $10 million pass that we get from the D uh, Department of Energy for uh, radiation safety uh, training. The other Superfund program is our Superfund research program. Um, as you can see, again, we have one particular type of center that counts for most of the spending. These are our P42 centers. But we also have a wedge here of small business um, grants. Uh, this orangish color here represents a con contribution from Superfund to our HERE grants. And there are a variety of other R25s, which are educational grants, R21s and conference grants. You don't see R01s here because I don't believe we funded any last year, but as you'll see in a minute, we are funding those going forward. Um, I've shown you this slide a couple of times before. Um, back in the early part of the pandemic, uh, Congress had a supplemental appropriation in which they gave our worker training program $10 million for coronavirus, coronavirus preparedness and response. This is to um, help train workers on how to, uh, who are at higher risk for exposure or disease on how to be more, how to protect themselves, be safer. Uh, the program has three particular components. One is um, to identify evidence-based methods for preventing exposure and reducing risk, developing some uh, virtual training platforms uh, to train responders, and then to build a cadre of trainers to present their training. They started this in 2020 and it got out a lot of, of supplements very quickly to spend most of the $10 million. They're spending the rest of the money uh, this fiscal year. Uh, they're, they're current, they released a notice of special interest um, a few months ago where they uh, will continue this kind of training, but with also um, aligning themselves with community groups as they do it. So it's kind of a special way to do things. Uh, let's see. Um, I want to switch for a second here and talk about some funding opportunities that were released for this year. Some of these have already been awarded and some of them are kind of in the process of being uh, uh, reviewed now. Um, sorry, I'm juggling too many notes here. Um, some of these you will recognize our core centers, our Young Investigator Ones Award, Victor, and so on. I want to focus here on the um, 
this, the RISE program. This is a program that um, Amanda Garden presented to council not too long ago is a concept in which we launched this in FY 2020. Um, it's a program that supports short-term research educational activities with the goal of improving knowledge and skills related to conducting environmental health science research. So it's for anyone doing um, EHS research. It's kind of a model of the Gordon's conference-like um, uh, training. Uh, so again, it's our first time we've done this. We've awarded, we think we're gonna award three grants and here's the set aside we have for that program. Um, continuing on the list here, um, we've mentioned the river. We funded uh, some of those this year, um, the small business validation, sensor validation program. And then, as I mentioned before, we had two uh, super fun research program uh, RFAs, one for the R01s on remediation and then the R25s on educational programs for emerging technologies. And finally, I wanna mention this program here. It's a US Indian collaboration that Sri Nadador developed starting about a year or a half ago, maybe. Um, and the, the goal of this um, program is to provide, uh, to promote collaborative research between Indian researchers and uh, US-based researchers looking at environmental health issues that are of common interest to both countries. And then I wanna finish up here by talking, uh, just letting you know about some of the co-funded uh, initiatives. These are initiatives from other institutes that we provided substantial co-funding uh, to. We've talked uh, earlier about the CD, CKDU, the chronic kidney disease, an unusual or unknown origin. Um, I mentioned last council around this cohorts of environmental exposures and cancer risks that we're conducting along with NCI. We will be continuing our, um, we have continued our geo health participation in the Fogarty program as well as working with uh, Massachusetts Institute of Aging on telomere research, and then continuing our investments in, in blueprint related uh, programs, the HEAL or Healthy Brain and Child Development Study, as well as our uh, program at um, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute on uh, indoor air pollution. So I wanna talk about just a few uh, DIRT activities here of different sorts. Um, just as we told you last round about the uh, the NCI cancer cohort study that we just mentioned that we were going to be joining. I want to let you know that we're going to, planning to continue our collaboration with the Autism Centers of Excellence program. This is a landmark NIH-wide initiative, $25 million. And you can see there are at least five institutes, including us, that are involved in this program. Um, the goals, fairly simply, are to understand the causes, including environmental exposures of autism, as well as the mechanisms to look at methods to identify and diagnose autism early as possible, of course, and then to develop innovative interventions and services for people with autism. There are two mechanisms involved in this, the larger P50 centers, and then associated um, uh, R01s and R21s that were built together to form a network for this uh, program. Uh, if you have further questions, as I direct you to Cindy Lawler, who's our point of contact for this program. And then um, we try to, at just about every council, rather tell you about the things we have done in the meetings and the things that we have participated in uh, since our last um, council meeting. So since September, we've had a number of grantees meetings, including Geo Health, two prime meetings. Prime is our um, mixtures program, our environmental health disparities meeting, and, and our uh, oceans and human health grantee meeting. Oops, sorry. And then we participated in the National Academy of Sciences PFOS workshop back in October. And then in uh, December, we had to, another series of grantees meetings, including the telomere uh, grantees, our HERE program, uh, Superfund had its annual meeting, uh, and um, uh, the worker training program held a uh, seminar related to vaccine usage and effect, efficacy in the workplace and some issues related to that. These are all, of course, of virtual meetings. Going forward, we usually like to tell you about things that are happening. We don't have, only have a few that I have to mention today between now and the next council meeting. One is a super fun program uh, dealing with data science. Uh, this is a follow-up to a large supplement program they did about a year and a half ago. A collaborative cross meeting in April. This is kind of a follow-up to the models population-based organ, model organ systems uh, RFA that we released a couple of years ago, focusing, I guess, on the collaborative cross. And then in June, we have an integrated multi-scale environmental exposure meeting. And this will be bringing together a variety of experts 
uh, looking at how to use um, things like geospatial modeling, uh, remote sensing, uh, and things like that to get a more uh, overall uh, gestalt kind of uh, way of uh, doing a better exposure assessment. So I want to finish up my part really quick by reminding you that we had a um, the theme from our last council meeting uh, largely was racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, this was in you know as a result of the a lot of the discussion going on in federal agencies related to this. I just want to touch on a couple of things that we talked about wanting to do that, that we have done, and uh, we'll let you know that we are continuing to work on this. We'll have an update on our uh, working group later on in the day, but just, just these are DER, DERT programs. The first is uh, research supplements to promote diversity. Uh, we mentioned that we, uh, back in September, that we have been funding this program fairly um, vigorously over the years, but we wanted to fund more. And so we're doing two things. One is we're, I, we have identified and set aside $2 million each year uh, to fund these. This is a, an aspirational amount. I don't know if we'll be able to make this this year, uh, partly because we um, we fund most every, all the applications we get. We need to get more in. So our goal is to try to advertise to grantees the uh, availability of these supplements, such as by telling our council about it in a public meeting. The other thing we're working on is to try to get these turned around faster in response to um, feedback we've gotten from our grantees about how long these take and how time sensitive they are. We've moved to a monthly receipt and review. So every beginning of every month, these are uh, received and we review them as quickly as we can and try to get them out the door as fast as we can. And we're also initiating an evaluation plan largely through the program analysis branch, which is Christy Drew's group, um, so that we can review things to uh, grants to lower the burden on our grants management staff, which is, can be fairly high toward the end of the year, as well as to maybe streamline and be more consistent with our processes. And then last uh, meeting, Mike Humble talked about a SCORE program that we had participated in. This, this was an NIGMS program. They're replacing that now with what's called the SURE program, and there's also a SURE FIRST program. But the general principles are the same. We want to uh, um, support under-sourced institutions, kind of like a, an area grant R15, uh, institutions that don't receive a lot of NIH funding, but especially those that represent a large number of students from underrepresented groups. The idea, of course, and, and in addition, we are, um, uh, I'm sorry, these programs uh, prioritize uh, uh, applications that engage students in research. So it's sort of like an area grant in that way as well. The goal, of course, is to try to build the infrastructure to have more at the institutions, but also to uh, increase the pipeline of students from underrepresented groups for future, uh, you know, in our EHS research. So we will be supporting this along with a number of institutes at NIH. So that wraps up my part of, of the talk. I would like to now turn it over to our acting DRT director, Gary Olson, who came on um, last month and has been getting his feet wet in a very fast way. Uh, Gary comes to us from the National Institute of Cancer, and he will tell you about his journey to get here and, um, and um, things that he is, reasons he wants to be here. So I will turn it over to you, Gary, and thank you. And we will hold questions to the end um, as time permits. Okay, Gary. If you're talking, Gary, you're on mute. Gary, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? There you are. Yes, there you yes, go. we yep. can hear you now. And I'm trying to figure out how to, okay, start my video. There we go. And now you can see me. Okay, yeah. good, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Pat, for the introduction. And I am uh, grateful for this opportunity to, to speak with you today. Um, I've interacted with many of you through our shuttle rides to the airport or over dinner. And uh, I thought, I thought um, and Dr. Warchick's, Warchick and Coleman thought that this would be a good opportunity for you to learn a little bit about my background and experience that you probably don't know. 
So a uh, breast cancer advocate and journalist who was part of the interagency breast cancer and environmental research coordinating committee said something that resonated with me and Gwen might remember this as um, they were writing the report for that. Um, she said, don't bury the lead. So I thought I'd start with um, my interest in this acting di uh, director detail and then go into um, some of my background uh, and experience. So it's no noteworthy that NIEHS has the environment as, it, uh, as its mandate. And this is, allows for a greater appreciation of its role across a greater number of disease states. And while NIEHS does quite a bit with its uh, a uh, little over $800 million budget, the importance of this topic lends itself to leveraging resources across uh, NIH institutes and centers where interests align. And in addition, it would allow me to gain a greater exposure and oversight over a range of disciplines within DERT and an opportunity to lead beyond program to include review and grants management, more fully appreciating their integration. And I come from the National Cancer Institute where the division focuses on program only. So this will allow me to, to expand my knowledge uh, to a greater degree. And of course, I'm sure you're aware of the highly talented and motivated and engaged NIEH staff who you've heard from and have interacted with over the years. And finally, I'm impressed with NIEHS's and um, DERT's efforts to address systemic racism through its focus on anti-racism, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I see this as a great opportunity to immerse myself in a new environment, learn new skills, and, and make a contribution to addressing some of those very important issues. So as the title of my talk suggests, my path to this point has been somewhat non-traditional. Uh, I earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from the Ohio State University, go Buckeyes. And I know Bob Wright and others attended the school up north and um, sorry. <laughs> um, and so there's an opportunity though. Um, I understand that the school up North Michigan I'm referring to has a good basketball team. And so they're number three, Ohio State is number four. They meet up on Sunday. So we'll see who gets bragging rights. And this picture, wow. This is what I did after college. I worked for an insurance company and I wrote estimates on red cars. I actually prepared, um, wrote uh, checks for the damage as well. And in this position, I, you know, I, I think this really shaped what I was going to do next in, in terms of my career. Um, I did this for several years and I noticed that, you know, I looked at cars just like this and I thought, wow, these people are lucky to be alive, but invariably they would talk about their cars and argue with me about their cars and getting it back to, to normal. And of course, I understand that that's my role is to get them back to where they were before the accident in terms of um, the repair of their damage. But this also led me to think about what I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my career. And health had always been an area of interest um, um, for me. And um, through this experience, I started to research public health. And I found that folks from multiple disciplines, even um, folks from the business area were involved in uh, public health. I pursued it. And I applied um, for a Master of Public Health degree um, at uh, Emory University, Rollins School of Public Health. That was a great experience. Um, I conducted my thesis uh, under Wayman Barnhart, looking at fear of falling in a community dwelling elderly population. This was an intervention comparing balance training along with Tai Chi and education. And there were multiple measurements uh, over a 72 week period. Um, 
And this allowed me to really apply um, you know, um, complex statistical methods in, in analyzing um, this complex question. So we use generalized estimating equa equations because there were repeated measurements of uh, not only the um, intervention, but also the outcomes associated with it. I really wanted to um, continue my education at that point. Um, and cancer was an area that was always of interest to me because of my strong family history of cancer, uh, primarily prostate cancer among first degree relatives. So I attended the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. Now I put this picture here of the Confederate flag flying on top of the state house, just to give an indication of you know, what I felt when I saw this, which was a couple of blocks from the School of Public Health. Um, and that actually shaped what I would pursue in my dissertation work, which focused on psychosocial stress and the risk of prostate cancer. Um, I collected my own data using um, cancer cases from the South Carolina um, uh, Central Cancer Registry and controls came from the Healthcare Financing Administration or HICFA, which is currently CMS. So of course we looked at uh, men 65 and over um, across uh, several counties within uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Um, the results with regard to um, psychosocial stress measured uh, using the COINS uh, perceived stress scale were negative. However, um, John Henryism, which is a measure of high effort active coping, um, seem to confer some risk of prostate cancer, particularly among those men with uh, low socioeconomic status. And so uh, upon completing my degree, I moved uh, to back to the DC area where I did a postdoc at the um, Howard University National Human Genome Center. Uh, Charles Rotimi was my mentor. Um, and I was investigator and project coordinator for a family study of obesity and also consulted with the Jackson Heart Study um, on helping them to develop pedigrees for um, their family study. The cancer remained a strong interest of mine. Um, and I applied to the NCI Cancer Prevention Fellowship program. I was part of the 2001 cohort. Martin Brown uh, was my preceptor. He's now retired. Um, and I did it in health ser services and economics um, research. Um, I analyzed SEER Medicare data. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, and my research focused on disparities, particularly uh, on surveillance following curative treatment for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and you know, I put this picture up, it's, it's hard to see. This is a picture of me during the uh, molecular prevention course where I'm holding a pipette. And as you can see from the experience I've shown, I'm not a laboratory-based scientist. Um, and so the, the Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program is interdisciplinary. We have basic scientists, uh, population-based scientists, health educators. And folks used to tease me because this picture was part of the brochure and they wondered why I was on, on the brochure holding a pipette and I wasn't a, li a laboratory based scientist, but I think it was just so um, that the program could uh, promote its inter interdisciplinary nature. And so my experience um, spans uh, industry, academia, and government. Um, I spent some time with ORC Macro, now ICF, as a project manager for the National Program of Cancer Registries Cancer Surveillance System. This is run by CDC. And my role was to collect uh, cancer incidence data for the United States and its territories and assess that data for quality um, and, and report that data back to the nation. Um, this was a, a great experience. 
And, and I decided to go on to do um, academic research uh, because I wanted to explore my ideas more fully um, with regard to um, uh, cancer and uh, disparities associated with cancer. So I spent some time at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. I had an appointment there as well as the Office of Policy um, and Planning. I started um, NCI in 2008 uh, as a program director where I led in collaboration with the Fogarty International City, an international meeting that took place in Guangzhou, China, that included 27 US-based scientists and 27 China-based scientists to discuss environmental pollution and cancer in the two countries and how those uh, two countries could cooperate better. Um, this meeting actually established the foundation for the US-China Program for Biomedical Collaborative Research, which has grown to include four um, other NIH institutes and centers, including um, NIEHS. This was my first project upon um, starting uh, NCI. I was also responsible for securing funding for NCI's participation in trans NIH initiatives led by other institutes and centers, especially NIEHS, such as uh, the Deepwater Horizon, GeoHealth, and the Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program, which you heard from uh, Rick uh, yesterday. And I was the scientific lead for NCI uh, on those projects. So this is a, a organizational compass for the National Cancer Institute so that you can get a better idea of where I fit um, with, within the Institute. Um, my position before coming on to NIEHS was uh, Chief of the Environmental Epidemiology Branch in the Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program. Um, and it's a position that I still hold while I'm while I'm here uh, on on detail officially hold while I'm here on detail, and I'm part of um, the EGRP's leadership team responsible for developing and implementing policies governing uh, the research programs operations. The epidemiology and genomic research program awarded uh, close to. $168 million in research funding, where close to 30% of it was held in the environmental epidemiology branch, which I oversaw. Many of the cohorts that you might be familiar with, such as the Nurses Health Study, the Nurses Health Study 2, the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, and the Southern Community Cohort Study, our research resources that we support uh, and fund and are held um, um, in, in the branch that I oversee. And so this is the mission of the environmental epidemiology branch. It uh, promotes and supports epidemiologic research on modifiable factors in cancer and diverse populations to inform and advance the prevention of cancer. Now in this uh, position, I oversaw a program of extramural research that focused on modifiable factors such as lifestyle factors like alcohol and tobacco use, obesity, physical activity, nutrition, energy balance, chemical and physical exposures, infectious agents, um, and expanding the concept of environment to include contextual factors like neighborhood socioeconomic status, for example. Um, and these are just some of the topics that um, we support uh, in this word cloud in the environmental epidemiology branches uh, grant portfolio. I also provide supervision and direction for five program directors, several that um, you may know um, they all uh, interact and co collaborate with uh, NIEHS uh, on at some level. Um, Kurt Delavalli is our newest program director. He's an environmental epidemiologist. Uh, he and Gabe Lai 
um, work with uh, NIEHS and and um, support NCI's efforts on the HERE initiative. Um, TRAM led the later stages of our breast cancer and environment research program. And as um, Pat mentioned earlier, um, NCI is leading the efforts to support new cohorts for environmental exposures and cancer risk. And, and, and um, Sandat Mahabir uh, is, is leading that effort. And we're really fortunate to have Gila Netta. Dr. Netta is part of our implementation science team in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Scientists and Sciences. She's also an environmental epidemiologist. And so she attends our branch meetings. She provides helpful comments on some of the initiatives that we discuss, and we're grateful to have them. And one of the most rewarding parts of my job, I think, is um, you know, the Cancer Research Training Award Fellows that, that we mentor uh, within our branch. Um, many of them have gone on, these are master's level fellows, many of them have gone on to uh, get a PhD in epidemiology or other disciplines. And um, you know, we still um, keep in touch with many of them. And I, I'd like to think that we provide a strong foundation for them to, um, you know, go to the next level of their career. And then, you know, our administrative staff, uh, we couldn't do uh, what we do without our um, administrative staff supporting uh, our activities. And these are some of the key initiatives. You've heard about some of them that we supported in the environmental epidemiology branch. Um, we are very interested in early life factors and later cancer development. Samdat Mahabir is leading that effort, and we also work with NIEHS on that. Um, geospatial approaches in cancer epidemiology is another, and you've heard about some of the others. One I want to focus on um, in, in the few minutes that I have left is an initiative that I um, led and supported within the National Cancer Institute. Um, and this area, cannabis and cancer, um, is a, a high priority area uh, within the National Cancer Institute. So this is a huge effort given the proliferation of laws governing medical and non-medical use and very little research on its effects on cancer and the use of um, and its use among cancer patients exists. Over the last five years, NCI has funded 16 grants, totaling about uh, $7.2 million, focusing on uh, cannabis cannabinoids or the endocannabinoid system. And some examples of research funding include the co-use of marijuana with tobacco and other substances, as well as the contextual environment that could influence use, particularly among adolescents and young adults. And this represents about, uh, in this green um, piece of the pie here, about 25% of the total cost uh, focused funding associated with cannabis and cancer. And a little more than 40% of grant funding supported research where cannabis was not the focus, but a component of the grant, the most significant being NCI's contribution to the NIH-led Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, or the ABCD study. In September of 2020, NCI provided uh, research support for cancer centers to conduct a survey of ambulatory cancer patients to understand the prevalence and patterns of cannabis use among this group. So investigators are currently collecting well-needed information on current and past use of cannabis, including the frequency and duration of use, uh, the modes of use. So are they smoking it? Are they using oils or tinctures and the therapeutic reasons for use? And investigators will also assess patients' perception of harm or benefit and discussions with and recommendations made by their clinical providers. 
So I led this effort. Uh, we supported 12 administrative supplements to our cancer centers up to $150,000 per award. It's a small amount of money, but we're gonna have a huge um, um, effort uh, for this little um, amount of money per center, totaling uh, $1.8 million in total funding. Um, each cancer center will collect data on at least 1,000 patients. So in the end, we will have robust data on the prevalence and patterns of cannabis use among at least 12,000 cancer patients undergoing or have recently uh, re completed active uh, treatment. Um, and we anticipate a diversity of cancer patients with regard to sex, race, ethnicity, um, SES, tumor type, uh, and, and geography. And more recently in December, 2020, um, I co-chaired a symposium on, um, uh, on cannabis cannabinoids and cancer research. And this um, really provided a summary of the science um, through the cancer control continuum from etiology all the way to cancer survivorship. Um, a summary of the science will be published as a special is uh, issue of the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. So we're looking forward to that. Um, this meeting was recorded and will be available on um, NCI's website. You can probably get to it through um, the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. But because this was a trans NCI effort, it will probably um, be available um, you know, uh, broadly across NCI. And below is a link where you can get more information about this um, meeting. So 2020, I, I know I just have a few minutes and I'm about to wrap up um, soon. Uh, 2020 has uh, been a, a tough year and, you know, for everybody. Uh, we've been working remotely and physically separated from each other for close to a year now. Uh, the murder of George Floyd has awakened many to the racial injustice and pain that Black people have been experiencing in the United States for centuries. And these are deep-seated issues that won't resolve themselves quickly, given that they are embedded in our systems uh, and their effects are likely transgenerational. And I applaud the NIH and institutes like NIEHS for committing to addressing anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, research funding, and the workforce, both within the division and the extramural community. And I realized that NIEHS has formed a diversity, equity, and inclusion working group that will begin to address some of these issues Pat mentioned earlier. And I acknowledge that discussions have been happening through various forums within NIEHS, including the powerful September council meeting. Two things stood out to me during that council meeting. One, during her very elegant presentation on the environmental impacts of, on sleep, Dr. Jackson emphasized the importance of diversity because of her lived, her lived experience informed her research. And it's my belief that diversity of thought and background enhances research and, and, and discovery. In addition, Dr. Goldman's comments about racism and how she likened it to a toxin that has deleterious effects. I think increasing diversity should not be viewed as a checkbox alone, because we know that structures exist that inhibit true equity and inclusion. We need to understand what those structures are and, and break them down. Um, so my vision for um, bringing leadership to addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and you know, I wanna recognize that in IEHS, it's, it's a, a key part of uh, its mission in terms of addressing in, in environmental health sciences, promoting translation, and enhancing environmental health sciences through um, stewardship and, and support. Um, so, so these issues are you know, highlighted throughout um, in our EHS's uh, strategic uh, vision. And having said that, um, I envision bringing leadership to addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion 
uh, is to listen, um, be brought up to, to speed on discussions and work that has already taken place within NIEHS, including data on diversity, um, and have more discussions with individuals within the divisions to garner an understanding of what is working well, as well as concerns and potential solutions. Uh, this idea can potentially enable us to ensure and promote an inclusive and equitable workforce within um, NIEHS. So we're talking about developing a framework within uh, DERT for addressing this that will include not only workforce culture, but also diversifying our extramural research um, um, scientist uh, team. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, align um, you know our efforts with the efforts of um, NIEHS, NIH's anti-racism efforts, which you'll hear a little bit about um, later today. And then we'd like to define metrics for success and and um, ensure that the division tracks and evaluates its uh, anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion activities. So I finished by showing a slide of a field trip um, for my branch that uh, we planned at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, I've been probably about five times. There's so much there. Uh, it's very rich in, in terms of um, its history, uh, the history of the African American people uh, from slavery until um, you know, a current time. Um, this was important to me because many people don't know the history of African Americans in this country, not only the hardships, but the significant contributions to its wealth and the successes of the Black community. And I hope um, that this would garner, you know, empathy and thought when thinking about our health disparities research efforts. And with that, I'll stop. I thank you for your attention. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Pat. Think. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, we kind of running in the end of our time, but I don't want to stifle any questions that council members might have. I, I would remind you that if you look at the agenda, we may have some time to talk, especially about the DEI uh, things that we've talked about at the end of the day. But um, I'm looking on the um, participants list. I don't see any hands raised or in the chat. Are there any questions from? Uh, Council members, before we move on to our next, uh, Marla, it looks like you have your hand up. Thank you so much for that presentation. I really, really appreciate your candor in in your last comments. And I am wondering, um, um, overall, we are funding a lot of research, cutting edge research. Uh, in things that might have little impact on policy. Um, we know enough about um, uh, environmental health since decades ago, but that knowledge doesn't permeate decision-making processes. So basically what we are facing is that the knowledge we produce doesn't permeate the action that is needed. Um, so what are we doing to address other kinds of research that might um, illuminate better uh, and why uh, that knowledge is not transferring like more uh, a political economy type of research or more structural type of research, policy research, et cetera. Is there any plans to address those uh, structural issues through research? Yeah, um, thank you. That That is a great question. I think NIEHS, as you know, has been the leader in terms of, um, you know, really uh, focusing on having community involvement in all of its research. And that's no exception for the research on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, there are a number of um, point, there are a number of um, initiatives where NIEHS is addressing that. But I wanna focus on, on one that was just uh, presented at National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, um, which will focus on research, not only observational research, but interventions 
um, that will su support um, research devoted to structural racism and discrimination. And IEHS has signed on to that effort. So not only will it support research to identify what those areas are, but it will support research to uh, focus on interventions that are designed to ameliorate some of the effects of these um, um, you know, racism and discrimination. And I, and, and I agree, there's still a lot of work to do, and that's gonna be part of our ongoing discussion. So thank you for that question, Marla. So Marla, if I could just chime in here, uh, you save that question, and um, after Tara Schwetz's presentation later, in, later today, it might be good to take this back up again and then ask Tara the question relative to the NIH as a whole, uh, not just NIHS. So very important question. Gary, that was a terrific presentation. And again, a welcome to NIHS. And um, I'm just really excited about having you on board you know, for all of the leadership that you can bring, uh, your knowledge of environmental health sciences, especially now bringing some of the leadership in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Pat, in the interest of Thank time, you. I think we should probably move on. Is that right? Yeah, well, and I think we're ready to go, John. Um, if you can pull up uh, the next presentation. And I saw a minute ago that Dr. Walker is with us and she will now, uh, John, yeah, if you can give- Do you mind if I just take a second and uh, have the honor of introducing our speakers? Yes, if you would. And in the meantime, John, if you can go ahead and give control to, to Dr. Walker, that'd be great. So Rick, go ahead, please. Okay, terrific. Well, again, it's, it's my honor to introduce uh, three speakers for this next session. Uh, many of you know them. They're all prominent members of the environmental health sciences community. So Dr. Cheryl Walker is a professor in the uh, departments of medicine and molecular and cell biology and molecular and human genetics. And she is the director of the Center for Precision and Environmental Health at Baylor College of Medicine. And currently is trying to find some places to stay warm and get some electricity. Uh, Dr. Dana Dolanoy is the professor um, in the departments of environmental health sciences and nutritional sciences at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Andrea Baccarelli is a professor and chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University. So in a recent phone call with Cheryl, which is always very interesting to be talking with Cheryl about the science that we do, uh, I became aware of the efforts that she and Dana and Andrea were, uh, are engaged in around planning the concept of, the, of precision environmental health. So I thought it would be useful to bring some of these new ideas to all of us at today's meeting and I thought it's a great example of the type of collaborative and innovative thinking that follows from nicely from those leadership values that I discussed with all of you at the meeting yesterday afternoon. So this is a team presentation and I'll start by turning the virtual podium over to Cheryl. So again, Cheryl, I hope that you're staying safe and that uh, at least in your office, it sounds like you're able to uh, keep yourself warm, um, but we, we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the invitation. We are absolutely delighted to have a chance to talk to you about uh, an area that really we have embraced in our three uh, P30 uh, NIEHS centers, and that is uh, precision environmental health. So uh, let me make sure that I can advance these. There we go. So, uh, so what is precision environmental health? Well, this is how we would define the research that is done at the intersection of genetics slash epigenetics, uh, environmental health and data science. And so analogous to precision medicine, and I know council has had uh, some discussions on this point, analogous to precision medicine, which is really about bringing the right treatments to the right patient for the right disease, really analogous to that precision environmental health really has prevention in its mandate and understanding how the environment and genetic slash epigenetics determines individual risk of disease in order to be able to prevent and intervene uh, in this disease. So I just want to make a point that even though precision health is really a, a great thing that is being uh, uh, embraced now and has gotten lots of traction recently, really NIEHS has been doing precision environmental health for a very long period of time. We can reach all the way back to the 90s when in fact uh, NIEHS uh, led the Environmental Genome Project. This was a fantastic initiative uh, that the Institute took a leadership role. Um, it soon actually became 
uh, human genome and more NIH wide, but really NIEHS was the one that saw how you could really link genetics and environmental exposures in a very powerful way. And so you can just look at this graphic of the number of times now over the decades that NIEHS has made major investments in initiatives or resources that have really advanced uh, precision environmental health. So just to reiterate, the goal of precision environmental health is really protection to prevent disease that occurs as a result of environmental exposure. And specifically what has in the past sometimes been a one size fits all approach to thinking about risk and susceptibility, uh, we now understand that we can really do much better. And so the idea is that based on enacting a precision environmental health portfolio, if you will, that now we can actually understand individual risk to specific exposures and to which specific diseases. It's also, I think, important to realize that precision environmental health and precision medicine are really part of a continuum. And so again, we think of precision medicine as understanding what is the uh, basis of the disease, the mechanisms of disease, the genetics of the patients, and then targeting therapies to those specific individuals to have the most efficacy. If we now put precision environmental health as part of this continuum, it's really looking up front to see what can be done to prevent disease in the first place. And so this now opens opportunities for doing not just population level prevention, but thinking about primary prevention, preventing disease, secondary prevention, where now we want to take occult early disease and prevent progression, or even seeing how we can help prevent um, acute disease from uh, having enhanced uh, morbidity and mortality. So let's just look at each one of these uh, individually. So how would precision environmental health as a framework uh, inform these different types of disease prevention? Well, in terms of primary prevention, of course, we understand about limiting impactful exposures, but we can also really understand who is at greatest risk for environmental exposures and for which diseases and be able to incorporate the environmental risk scape as a whole, thinking about both the uh, socioeconomic, uh, geographic, demographic factors, as well as environmental exposures to um, chemicals in the environment, the internal environment, take this in a more holistic way that will hopefully help us get beyond more imprecise screening as a prevention tool to now actually putting our resources to where we can monitor those that are at the most risk. And so what about secondary prevention? Well, of course, this is where we want to be able to not only detect very early disease, but to also keep it from progressing. And so we really need to understand, and I think this is an area that really deserves a lot of uh, additional interest, is understanding how very early disease is now being promoted by environmental uh, exposures. And to use this knowledge to uh, improve early detection and again, screening of those individuals who might be a greater risk for having an underlying uh, early disease that can be exacerbated uh, by the environment. Let's see what's going on here. And finally, for tertiary, this is where we want to take an existing disease that's being recognized, but again, prevent it from getting worse. And I think one of the uh, clear examples of this is thinking about, for example, um, asthmatic patients and exposure to PM 2.5 and understanding how that exacerbates disease. So again, you can take the right kind of uh, steps to help present that uh, interaction from happening. And then even things such as understanding how drugs that you may be on as a result of a chronic disease may be influenced by your environmental exposures. And we can just take activation of P450 enzymes as an example of where an environmental exposure might change the level of activity in such a way that it could influence the benefit of a drug that that um, individual is taking. And then of course, we would hope to be able to have develop using the insights that we learn from how the environment has caused the disease throughout these various stages to now have uh, targeted and more effective interventions uh, to help uh, ameliorate these uh, effects.
So I want to now present to you uh, three examples of how we can deploy, and in fact, how we are deploying, uh, the concepts of precision environmental health uh, in a research framework. And then uh, when I'm done going through these examples, uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the podium to Dana Dolanoy, who's going to give you some additional examples uh, as well. So let's start with the first one, which I think might be maybe the most obvious, which is by looking at genetics, epigenetics, environment, and looking at this in a holistic omic way with data science, that we can understand new targets, mechanisms, and biomarkers for how environmental exposures cause human disease. And one of the great success stories in this area really has been the uh, target consortium uh, that was launched by NIEHS in 2013, which was this idea of understanding how uh, gene expression and the epigenome in particular might be influenced by environmental exposures. This was, of course, accelerated by the epigenome roadmap that came out in 2015 and has led now to the current Target 2 consortium, which I'm going to spend just a minute on here. This is from uh, a publication uh, that came out from the consortium in uh, Nature Biotechnology. And what it shows here is that these consortia groups across the country are looking at a number of different environmental exposures. And uh, we are um, doing cohorts of animals uh, who are now being exposed very early in life to these exposures. And then those cohorts of animals are being followed throughout their life course. And we're monitoring all across the way, both the changes in gene expression that are being um, affected by those exposures, as well as the perturbations of the epigenome that are being caused by these exposures and are also persisting across the life course. And then looking at what are the phenotypes and what are the effects on these animals at different stages across um, the life course. Looking at uh, metabolic disease, uh, cardiopulmonary disease, developmental, reproductive, cancer, so on and so forth. So this has been a very powerful example of how we can come together as a community to learn things about targets, mechanisms, and develop biomarkers. And in this particular consortium, I just want to mention that in addition to the target tissues that are being looked at, we are also looking at surrogate tissues, looking at blood and skin, so that now again, we can have something that can be translated from the consortium studies to human population studies. So the second of the three uh, areas where I want to talk about deploying these concepts of precision environmental health is understanding where in model systems there is conservation of pathways and mechanisms of disease. And so, for example, uh, papers are starting to come out like this one in cell reports. This was recently done by meta-analysis looking at animal models of Alzheimer's disease and comparing in a very holistic way what is known about what is happening in the human disease and then comparing that in, again, in a systems biology type approach to what is going on with various known and mouse models for Alzheimer's and seeing where there's overlap. Where do we have confidence that these um, models that are being used to study disease are actually recapitulating various aspects of Alzheimer's? And again, by doing this in a systems biology context, you can really get a feel we understand no model is perfect, but you really get a feel from which aspects of the human disease are in fact um, going to be able to be interpretable from data that you will get in an animal model. But the third area for deploying this is actually one that I think is incredibly exciting and I think is one that we are just beginning to unlock the treasure chest that is going to be available to us. And this is how we can use these approaches not to learn something that we already know, but to learn new things that might actually surprise us and where there might be new opportunities for doing both forward and reverse translation using these huge and very powerful omics data sets that are now becoming uh, available. And so, for example, in the Target 2 consortium, uh, we are looking at a number of environmental exposures and I have a list for them uh, for you here. And we want to really understand how are these exposures affecting 
um, the uh, tissues, the target tissues um, in the animals that have been exposed early in life and then will develop disease uh, much later in life. And so we can take a lot of um, hypothesis driven uh, approaches and ask very specific questions about how particular agents may be um, driving disease sequela, but we can also take a very unbiased approach. And so what I have here for you is an example. If you look at um, human liver disease, there are now many, many very large data sets that are out there where they have done profiling studies on, in some cases, very large numbers of individuals uh, that have uh, liver cancer or non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease. And so what I wanna show you is an example of reverse translation where we can take these large omic human data sets and apply them to the data sets that we are generating in the consortia in order to learn new things about how environmental agents are causing adverse health effects. And I just have to give credit to Dr. Christian Corfa and Sandy Grimm here at Baylor who are part of the Target 2 Consortium because they have really pioneered this type of reverse translation from large human data sets onto these uh, mouse exposure studies. And so we have, for example, many, many uh, data sets that we're generating from uh, normal, and I'm just showing you now male liver, just to help focus our discussion. But for example, we have profiled normal three week old liver. We have profiled five month liver and 10 month liver. We've looked now at the effects of TBT, TCDD, all of the agents that you see up there uh, on the liver. So we have these very large data sets. And what um, we've been able to do now is take a reverse translation approach of where we're going to overlay the human data on our mouse data and ask, is the human data able to teach us something about our environmental exposures? And we do this through what's called a signature correlation matrix, where we're gonna align data sets here along this axis and data sets on this axis. And then we're gonna ask if we read across a row and down a column and look where they intersect, uh, do we see that there are some significant correlations and what are those correlations telling us? So this is just a, um, an example for you, but let me go to a real place where we've now been able to do this. So let me orient you on this particular signature correlation matrix. So what we have now is on this correlation matrix, again, we've arrayed uh, data sets here um, on the y-axis, and we've arrayed the exact same data sets here on the x-axis. So if you just draw a line through here, it looks exactly the same here as it does here, because when the same data set intersects itself, it's a perfect correlation. But what we have now is we have now let this signature correlation matrix program take our exposure signatures where we have an exposed animal and a vehicle animal that is age and sex match and we see what genes are differentially expressed. And we also can even do a vehicle to vehicle comparison. So we can say, okay, we have a three week um, mouse liver and we have a five month mouse liver. That's a vehicle to vehicle comparison. So we set all these comparisons up and then this signature correlation matrix approach will array them for us in a particular order. So what you see here reading this axis, and again, these are the exact same samples down here, is we have our BPA exposure, what genes were differentially expressed from BPA versus vehicle, TBT versus vehicle, uh, what happened between three and five months at the University of Michigan Consortium, University of Chicago Consortium, here's PM 2.5. This right here actually is a, is a um, combined consensus um, aging signature between between three and five months, but we put all this in and what you can immediately see is that um, these areas down here, these are the gray aging signatures. They correspond to these signatures right here. But what I wanna show you is the most dramatic thing that comes just from this one comparison is that in fact, there's a lot of red and a lot of blue. So there are things in the human signature that are lighting up our mouse signature in places that we would not have expected. 
And where are those places? Well, let's just take this as an example. We have strong positive correlations here between exposures to PM 2.5 and to a certain extent to phthalate with what happens during normal aging. So here, if you read across and down, here we go. This is an aging signature, an aging signature. 11 is the composite aging signature. And so there is a very strong positive correlation with human setting with what is happening in our exposures when we look at them under the lens of what happens in normal aging. And even more dramatic, we have this very positive negative correlation, again, between BPA, TBT, and TCDD, again, when we align these exposure signatures against what should be happening with normal age. So this is a reverse translation now that is telling us something that we may not have known about what our exposures are doing in mice. And so I'm just gonna drill down quickly for you on TBT as an example. So here in this Venn diagram at five months of age are the genes that are differentially expressed in response to TBT. And some of these genes go up and some of these genes go down. But what you'll notice is there is an overlap with the genes that normally change with age in the mouse liver. And in fact, about half of the TBT signature are where genes have been changed by TBT in their expression profile that are also normally changed with age. But look at this. This gene set here is going up as a result of the early life TBT exposure when it should be going down and vice versa. Here's genes that should normally be going up with age and they're going down with TBT. This is why that correlation you saw on the correlation matrix was blue because it was an inverse correlation. Whatever these exposures have done, they have arrested or reversed what should have been happening with normal age. Now, if we look at the epigenetic level, and I'm just going to show you one small example, here are genes that go down with aging normally in the liver, and here are these genes right here. And if we look at histone epigenetic marks that are active marks, if a gene is going down with age, you would expect those active marks to go down as well. And in fact, you see that about half of the genes that go down normally with age lose these active histone marks. And so if you now look, for example, at what an exposure has done to that particular epigenetic mark, and I'm just showing you again one example, here's one gene right here. This is an integrated genome browser view of all six of the animals combined together. But if you look here around the promoter of this UPP2 gene, what should have happened between three weeks and five months is that this active mark would have gone down in the normal aging liver. But look at what has happened in the animals that saw TBT during development. This mark did not go down. In fact, this mark went up tremendously and the gene itself has gone up as well instead of going down. And it's not just TBT, I'm just showing you the same thing here with TCDD, half the signature was again an inverse arrested or reversal of aging in the liver, same thing with BPA as well. I just want to point out that the idea that aging may be a target for these environmental exposures was also seen not just in BPA here in the Target 2 study, but this was also seen recently in a publication that just came out in uh, Nature Communications that was work that was supported by the Target 1 study. So what has this reverse translation shown us? This reverse translation in an unbiased way, when we looked at the human data, applied it to our mouse data sets, was that the plasticity of aging created a vulnerability to multiple environmental exposures that either then either um, reversed or arrested that particular type of um, change in gene expression, or in fact exacerbated it. And so just very quickly, I want to show you some examples of the more classic forward translation where we've been able to use the data that we obtained with these environmental exposures to learn something new about the human disease. And so here I want to show you again that we're focusing on this anti what we're calling anti aging or reverse or arrested aging profile, which now when we look at 10 months of age when our animals have developed fatty liver disease and in some cases hepatocellular carcinoma. When we take this part of the TBT 
signature in the liver, we can actually use the genes that have been the targeted by TBT here to go back into human populations and stratify individuals based on the severity of their non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is just one data set where we've done this. So we've taken these genes and we've taken every patient in the data set and stratified them by the extent to which they reflected the tumor signature and the extent to which they had this reversed or uh, normal aging profile. And what you can see is that using this gene set, we can stratify those patients with normal livers in the upper quadrant and remarkably, we can stratify the patients with the most severe disease in the lower quadrant. And not just for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but this also is true for hepatocellular carcinoma as well. Again, we're going to take this arrested uh, reversal aging signature from what TBT has done. And we've seen this in the tumors that arise in these animals. And we are able to do an amazing job of stratifying and differentiating between normal and patient disease tissue using this signature here as well. So what exactly is in the signature that is able to do this remarkable job of stratifying human population? Well, if we now look at this signature, what we see is that the top terms in which we have enriched for changes in gene expression are those involved in biomechanical stress, tissue stiffness, the way it responds to the um, uh, matrix around it, something that has really not been appreciated to be uh, of importance in some of these liver diseases. So I just then want to close by saying this is an example of where we have used forward translation by doing genetics, epigenetics, environmental science, environmental exposures and data science to where using our mouse data, we've now gotten new insights into mechanisms of uh, the human disease and are now focused on how these genes involved in biomechanical stress are potentially contributing to these important human diseases. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton over to Dana Dolanoy, who will tell you about some other very exciting examples of this type of work. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, hello from wintry Michigan where Cheryl and the rest of Texas probably thinks they are this week. Good, I'm able to control the screen now. Thank you very much, Dr. Wojcik and to NIEHS Council for the invitation to talk with you today. For the middle part of this talk on precision environmental health, I'm going to discuss how we can begin to identify individuals at risk for environmentally induced diseases using epigenetic biomarkers. To start, I'll stick with the target to mouse model, but we are going to focus on looking at lead exposure. In this example, mouse mothers were exposed to lead throughout the perinatal period, the two weeks prior to, to um, conception, the three weeks of gestation and the three weeks of lactation. And this results in a damn blood level around 30 micrograms per deciliter. So although this is typically higher than today's exposure, it's not out of the realm of consideration for past human exposures. As you have begun to hear, hear today from Cheryl, the first target to consortium wide signature is liver. And we also profile a surrogate. And in this case, I'm gonna focus on the surrogate of blood although you heard that we also have profiling in the, in the surrogate of skin. So those of you who have been following lead exposure, think of it mostly as a neurotoxicant, but lead has also been shown to be associated with obesity. And so this works out well with looking at liver for the target tissue. And to complement Cheryl's data that she just showed on gene expression and histone modifications, this example will focus on DNA methylation. So here I am showing you sex stratified differentially methylated regions at five months of age in the offspring. So these offspring had not seen lead exposure for over four months. And you can see in the blue and the green, hundreds of differentially methylated regions. The blue regions are increased or hypo, the blue regions are decreased or hypomethylated and the green regions are increased um, or hypermethylated. 
So the biggest barrier to thinking about epigenetics as a biomarker for precision environmental health is the question, do these regions of differential methylation overlap between the target tissue? In this case, that's lead. I mean, I'm sorry, that's liver and the surrogate tissue in this case, which is blood. And the short answer is yes, some of them do. So here you can see in females, there are over 180 genes that are differentially methylated that overlap between the target tissue of liver and the surrogate of blood. There are even more in males. But what's truly amazing is if you compare the overlap between males and females and liver and blood, there are 35 genes and these are all enriched for obesity related phenotypes, including type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. What else is very interesting about analyzing um, this data set is that it is enriched for genes that are what we call genomically imprinted genes. Imprinted genes are monolithically expressed by the parent of origin, and this is due to epigenetic mechanisms, including DNA methylation and long non-coding RNAs. Of these four imprinted genes, GNOS is particularly interesting because it has been shown in the past to be stably altered by environmental exposures. Joe Coxmansky in our lab a few years ago showed that perinatal BPA exposure results in mouse blood, GNAS DNA methylation, and gene expression changes stably over time, which you can see in the diagram here, where they're looking at the same sets of mice at two months of age, four months of age, and 10 months of age. You can see that there's a lack of DNA methylation in the controls and an increase in DNA methylation across all time points in BPA. Others have found in humans that altered DNA methylation of GNOS can be seen after occupational exposure in gas powered machinery plants. And we know that imprinted defects, including GNOS, are often associated with early onset obesity and other growth and metabolism defects. And this is due to the fact that imprinted genes are reprogrammed very early in development, just after fertilization, and also during gametogenesis. So all of this is leading us to identify different regions that overlap between liver and blood, but also where we can begin to focus when we start looking at human population health. So the first diagram I'm showing you here is how we can begin to conceptualize epigenetics as a mechanism of disease. So this is the gold standard, what we really want to do. But unfortunately, many human population studies aren't powered or designed in a way to look at epigenetics in the causal pathway. So instead, we look at how epigenetics are associated with an exposure and how that exposure is associated with disease. And once this relationship is established, we can do additional things with the epigenome. We can use the epigenome as a disease predictor. This can be done in a longitudinal way, shown here if you have an early epigenetic biomarker and can follow individuals to later in life. Or this can be done in a cross-sectional way, where if you have an epigenetic measurement at the same time where you measure disease. To begin to show how we can look at environmental legacy, I am showing the long-term element Mexico City birth cohort here. And because of this long-term design where the individuals were began to be recruited in the 1990s and have been followed up to today, we can ask three important questions for figuring out epigenetics as a biomarker for precision environmental health. The first is to examine whether associations between DNA methylation and prenatal exposures, including lead, which I'll show you in a bit, are present at birth. And also, that's, oops, that's this right here. And also whether prenatal exposures persist over time in a peri-adolescence. We can also begin to assess associations between childhood exposures and childhood and adolescent DNA methylation. Finally, because of the long-term follow-up in this cohort, you can examine relationships between exposures, epigenetic marks, and outcomes, and the element birth cohort is particularly, well, excuse me, all the way up to Dr. Baccarelli slides there. Hold on. Okay, is particularly interested in metabolic phenotypes. I apologize, my keyboard is very sensitive today. All right. 
So this is the first data slide from Element that I'd like to show you. And what we've done here is taken a very popular epigenetic tool called the Illumina Bead Array, which allows us to look at almost 1 million DNA methylation sites in one experiment. And this is just one snapshot of data that we, show, we found here. But here we have found that maternal first trimester blood lead levels are associated with DNA methylation of the PD GFLR gene at birth. And this is really important because this is a tumor suppressor, suppressor gene. So what is a tumor suppressor gene doing being altered, being altered at birth and how does that impact long-term disease susceptibility? The second thing we're able to do in a cohort with long-term design is ask whether these effects persist in later in life. And here I'm showing you peri-adolescence, which is a particular time point that's really relevant to me because I am the mother to two tween boys. So here we see that maternal blood lead levels, but not maternal bone lead levels or childhood lead blood lead levels are associated with altered DNA methylation at what is called the line one transposable element. And this is a repetitive element that's present um, in about 17% of our genome. And it's used as a sort of a bellwether for whether an environmental exposure can induce changes at DNA methylation more broadly. So here, early maternal exposure to lead led to persistent epigenetic changes in line one in those tweens. So once we have established that environmental exposures can influence DNA methylation, the, first, the next step is to assess whether these can affect disease. And to show this concept, I'm going to switch cohorts to a um, new cohort called the Healthy Families Project. And we'll begin to look at disease predictor relationships. To do this, we're taking advantage of a really neat biospecimen called neonatal blood spots and asking the question, are neonatal blood DNA methylation levels associated with long-term obesity status? Second, do obesity-related genes exhibit that age-related DNA methylation plasticity that Cheryl introduced us to in a human cohort? And finally, are there moderators, including things like physical activity and diet, that influence the relationship between neonatal blood spots and obesity status in children later in life? So to do this, the Healthy Family Project works with Michigan pediatricians who are looking at three different age sets of children. So we're looking at infants who are one to two years old, preschool toddlers that are three to five year olds, and um, 10 to 12 year old elementary school children. All of these families or children consented to a contemporary blood draw, as well as different anthropometry, uh, physical activity, diet data, but more importantly, they all consented for us to access the neonatal dried blood spot that was collected at birth. In this way, we can do longitudinal um, comparison of contemporarily recruited cohorts. It's a really um, interesting way to think about um, environmental exposures at birth. So here I'm showing you a complex data slide, but what this shows first in the preschool group, blood line one DNA methylation, which I just showed you was associated with lead in the element cohort, showed a significant negative association with obesity. So at birth in the neonatal blood spot, we can get a clue for which children will become obese later in life due to line one DNA methylation. Also, another interesting biomarker was the IGF-2 imprinted gene, which we have also shown in the Target and other consortium are particularly associated with many environmental exposures. In the neonatal blood spot, across several of the different ages of children, IGF-2 DNA methylation was marginally predictive of having obesity later in life. But what's really neat about this study design is we have blood from two different ages of children. And so you see the infants in red, the toddlers in green, and the elementary age school children in blue. And so what you're seeing is the difference in DNA methylation between birth and their contemporary blood draw. And at all six of these genes, as well as the line one transposable element, you see significant age-related changes. So what this means is that the genes that were predictive of future obesity were also those that normally changed with age. This means that they retain their epigenetic plasticity. So in conclusion, by combining different population studies, 
we first showed in element that environmental exposure to lead induced changes in line one, as well as IGF-2, but here in the Healthy Families cohort from the, University, from the state of Michigan, we can see that these two biomarkers also predict obesity status at different ages of childhood. In addition, all of the genes that we investigated in Healthy Families showed this age-related change in DNA methylation. And finally, what I wasn't able to show you today is that you can use different um, factors to look at moderation. And in healthy families, we did find that the physical activity status of the children, but not their diet, was a moderator of the relationship between DNA methylation and obesity status. So with that, I am going to pass the Zoom baton over to my colleague, Andrea Baccarelli, to conclude our pre presentation on precision environmental health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Dana, and uh, thank, thank you for the invitation of being here. Let's see whether I can control the screen. Yes, I am. Okay, and uh, so my, my, my role here is to build upon uh, the wonderful presentations that uh, Cheryl and Dana presented and uh, think about how we can apply all of this into public health. And uh, so this slide shows a conceptual model of precision environmental health where uh, by measuring individual exposures, we are able to combine those with what we call precision tools, whether that is genomics or uh, technology or uh, GIS and big data and something we call lifetime biosensors. And I'll go, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit to create uh, disease risk estimates and to use that for interventions both at the individual level and at the community level. So to pick out people, uh, communities or individuals that uh, are more uh, susceptible will benefit the most from interventions. So let me go to, um, to the idea of biosensors. And again, this uh, uh, builds on the concepts and data that Dana presented on uh, DNA methylation and epigenetics. We have uh, evidence now that we can use DNA methylation to create a fingerprint uh, that is specific to each exposure. Not just of exposures now, but potentially of lifetime exposure. So we can think about the epigenome uh, functioning like a tape recorder that records our lives. And uh, I'll give an example from uh, research that was led by our colleague Stephanie London at NIHS, uh, to which we also contributed as part of the CHARGE consortium, that is about lifetime tobacco smoking and DNA methylation. Uh, this was a study of 16,000 people. Um, and uh, through this study, we found that smoking was associated with differences in DNA methylation at more than 7,000 genes. That is more than one third of human genes. What was really interesting is that in those who quit, uh, most methylation sites return to normal within five years, but some took longer. And there was a small subset that even after 30 years of quitting, and you can see here on the left-hand side, were still there. They changed a little bit, but never went back to normal. So this really shows that the epigenome really can uh, keep track of what happened to our bodies 30 years before. And this has now been uh, uh, leveraged to create uh, some algorithms that can predict tobacco smoking. You can see here a few of them that have been already published. What is really interesting is these are uh, completely data-driven. There is no biological information that goes into building this algorithm, completely based on data and uh, just, just just sites that get picked out because they predict smoking very well. And not only they predict whether someone is a smoker now, but also whether they were before, earlier. Uh, and also they can uh, uh, give information about the number of cigarettes smoke lifetime. Um, for those who quit, how long they've been no smokers and so on. And of course, this has been already used in uh, several applications. Uh, also, the one to rush into this were uh, life insurances and health insurances that are now using this to
to assess the risk of their user base. But I think this can be used also with environmental chemicals and pollutants. And for instance, one example I would like to give is that of work led by Elena Colicino, who is now an assistant professor at Mount Sinai, who used exactly the same approach to find uh, um, a methylation fingerprint that can predict long-term cumulative lead exposure. Uh, we used a data set that is special. This is from the normative aging study uh, because we had measures of bone lead. Those are uh, X-rays based uh, um, measurements. We didn't, we didn't biopsy bones in these people. Uh, but it's an interesting measure because differently from blood lead, this is worth uh, 10 years plus of exposure. So it's really a very long term uh, type of exposure measurement that is very unique. There are only a few centers around the world who can do this. Uh, but now with the methylation, uh, uh, Elena was able to combine uh, 60 to 140 methylation sites that can also predict uh, bone lead, long-term bone lead, but can be done on blood. And this is something you can do really to measure cumulative, perhaps lifetime exposure to chemicals. And there are now similar uh, uh, scores that have been used for uh, air pollution and other chemicals. Well, the, the question is, okay, we have this amazing science, these amazing biomarkers. How can we use it to actually go into the field, go to patients, and uh, deploy precision medicine or precision environmental health. An example of this is the ongoing TACT study. This is uh, a trial funded by different institutes, including NIHS. And what is it? it's a follow-up to the first TACT. This is TACT2, it means there was a TACT1. And TACT1 showed uh, that uh, uh, there was a benefit from chelation therapy. It's a trial of EDTA chelation, in particular to chelate lead and cadmium. And uh, in particular, the benefit was from in, on those people post myocardial infarction who had diabetes. And you can see here on the right, the strong effect that was found. This is a replicative trial. And what is interesting is one of the hypotheses is that among this group of people with diabetes and MI and previous MI, those who especially benefit from the therapy will be those with high levels at baseline in their bodies of cadmium and lead. So if this, is, this hypothesis is true, you can think about a future where uh, uh, doctors will, uh, will prescribe uh, chelation only on those people who have high levels in their bodies of lead and or cadmium. So really we are a place where uh, the environment can become part of decisions that are precise in the realm of precision medicine. Well, we can perhaps uh, push the envelope even further and think uh, not a decision based on uh, one variable or one uh, uh, measurement like lead or cadmium, but uh, a combination of, uh, of variables. And this has been done extremely well in cardiovascular medicine. You might be familiar with the Framingham um, risk score. One more recent version of this is shown here is the live simple seven. It's a combination of seven simple risk factors that predict very well uh, cardiovascular risk, risk of, a, of a MI and stroke. And of course, this is being used for uh, decisions to manage patients. Another way to do this, and this is also very active in cardiovascular medicine, are um, scores based on genomics. So while the Life Simple 7 and the risk factors base combine risk factors, these ones combine genes. And there are several that combines hundreds of genes. Usually, again, this is uh, data-driven. No information is fed into the score based on biology. Uh, is usually based just on uh, uh, statistical strength, uh, but they also predict risk uh, to a certain extent well, though there is, the jury is still out whether this can be used for clinical practice. And I would argue um, that perhaps what we need is to consider that uh, if you want to predict disease, you need to consider the environment. 
In fact, there are some estimates that peg the fraction of human diseases attributable to environmental causes as high as 70 to 90 percent. So if you want to really predict disease, and of course, environmental causes, this also included the risk factors uh, that I showed before. So I think if we want to create the good, pre effective, predictive tools, we want to combine not just personal risk factors and genomics, but also use environmental data. We can think about uh, a future where all these resources are put together. And of course, we need uh, contemporary machine learning and AI to make this possible and to make sense of this data and put them into a prediction framework. Well, this might be the future, but there are opportunities that are happening now. And uh, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, um, all of us, for instance, this cohort is, is recruiting 1 million uh, Americans all over the country and following them longitudinally. It's an amazing opportunity for environmental health and for precision environmental health. There are um, low investments with high return that we can think about. And this, there's been discussion already within all of us where you can link uh, maps, uh, geospatial models of air pollution, built environment, climate, or pesticides uh, based on uh, where people live or work, and uh, just uh, provide, enrich this data with uh, an opportunity to assess uh, their um, risk related based on the environment. Um, you can perhaps invest a little more and get their blood or urines and uh, measure environmental chemicals, environmental exposures, uh, biomarkers. And perhaps the, a prototype of what could be done is already happening here at Columbia uh, in a study uh, recently funded by NIA uh, with uh, Richard Mayo and Gary Miller as uh, multiple PIs, where, which is the Columbia YCAP Alzheimer's study. This is a longitudinal follow-up study, 30 years worth of follow-up, people without Alzheimer's at baseline. Uh, and now with uh, uh, many cases of uh, Alzheimer's, we are uh, uh, getting to having more than here, the more than, uh, uh, more than, than, two, than 2,000 cases of Alzheimer's. And uh, in this new grant, uh, Gary and Richard will uh, analyze 8,000 samples from this cohort with the high resolution mass spectrometry, which as you know, provides data on high resolution metabolomics on more than 20,000 features, including a few hundred, perhaps thousands of exogenous organic chemicals. So you had this study where you can get 30 years worth of exposure and 30 years worth of follow-up with a very rich multi-omic data already available. So you can really combine not just the exposure, not just genomics, but also the everything that's in between in terms of responses in the body. And um, with modern machine learning and AI, you can put it together with very refined prediction models. Well, I speak about, uh, we, we all often hear speaking about machine learning and AI as something that is the future, but indeed it's also the present. For instance, this is um, a project funded by NIHS uh, through the PRIME program, and uh, Marianne Kiamorzogolo is leading it. And she had this idea of using an approach, a machine learning approach that is usually used in uh, visual recognition and surveillance. So I learned through Marianne that the average uh, New Yorker uh, goes in front of a camera, of a surveillance camera, in average 100 times every day. And I really thought that, that behind each camera there was a person watching us. Uh, instead, uh, it looks like that many of these cameras are plugged in into a software that uh, can look at the images every second and can ring the bell if something abnormal is happening. And Mariante had the thought that this can be used also with chemicals, particularly with the mixtures uh, of air pollution components. And um, she's able to feed in uh, air pollution models into the, so into the algorithm, into the model, and learning about unusual deviation of the usual patterns 
and also looking at uh, outlier events that can be particularly threatening with the idea of making this information actionable, the idea particularly to identify sources of harm of harmful exposures or even uh, unusual harmful behavioral patterns or usual for the matter. Uh, so that, uh, that is uh, pretty interesting, but one area that we thought uh, it's pretty interesting is that we can use these systems not just to prevent exposures, but also to go back to the communities and communicate risk. And this is an example from uh, uh, Cheryl's uh, uh, center in Texas, uh, where there was an amazing application, I think, of uh, creating an, an online web portal to help people potentially exposed to the deep water horizon oil spill to assess the risk. So anyone in the community could go online and um, put in their data, uh, particularly where they live and work, and, um, and also the food that they had been eating. And that will give them an estimate of their exposure to PAH and also an estimate of their biological impact due to the exposure. So this, you can think how you can start to feed these models in and let people know, uh, give back to the community information that they may want to know about their individual risk. And we all know how, now that we are all exposed to COVID, how threatening it is to each of us uh, to be under the threat of a common exposure. And it would be amazing to people who have been exposed to an event like this to give them more detailed information about their risk. I just want to finished by saying thank you so much for inviting all of us. We've really been incredibly appreciative of this opportunity and we hope that together we can lead the way to make our world better and healthier. Thank you so much. I hope we'll have time for some discussion. Great. Well, thank, thanks to all three of you for just a spectacular set of presentations. Um, this is really, really very interesting. I just want to let everyone know that we started late. I've been emailing with Pat. Uh, so we're going to delay the break for lunch until 1215. So we have some time to entertain some questions. So let's open it up to members of council. Uh, so anyone would like to pose a question. It looks like uh, we have um, Dr. Wright's hand is up first, followed by Dr. Cavanaugh. Let's see, Gary. OK, so Bob, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thank you. Great presentations. Um, so I wanted to try to relate some of the discussion back to um, systemic racism. And there are um, obviously being exposed to environmental chemicals, toxic environmental chemicals is not random. It's, it's clearly tracked by race and socioeconomic status. Access to treatment is not random. It also tracks by race and socioeconomic status. Uh, status, and even the probability of getting higher quality care tracks by the same. And so I think there are actually some really interesting social justice and environmental justice issues that could be addressed by employing exposomics or environmental chemical analysis in patients. And there's a lot of chemicals that we know a lot about. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit on lead exposure and neurodegeneration or lead exposure and neurodevelopment or even lead in kids with um, autism and how it affects the disease. So what, what there, but there are very few examples of any studies actually addressing those questions. So what do you think the barriers are to doing those kinds of studies? Because I think they're very important studies that would have a big impact on a lot, lot of people. That's a great question. Uh, Cheryl, you've been shaking your head. Uh, do you want to do you want to address that? Uh, you no, know, I think Andrea is going to have a really good answer. But Bob, your question triggered a thought that I had not had not even occurred to me. You know, when I was talking about this reverse translation with these human data sets onto experimental studies, you know, we could actually stratify that human data by all those things you said. And it would be very interesting if you took liver cancer or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and separated that by socioeconomic environmental justice neighborhoods where people lived and see whether or not we get a different answer 
when we reverse translate that data to some of these known exposures based on that stratification. So I think that would be fascinating. But Andrea, I'm sure you or Dana would be able to directly address the question about barriers to Bob. I mean, I, I just want to say I couldn't agree more. And uh, I think that uh, um, there is a lot that, I mean, whenever we measure exposure, whenever we measure the responses to the exposure, uh, inequalities and, and uh, systemic racism uh, are a factor in that. And I, I think I learned from you actually, Bob, the importance of social stresses and environmental exposure as well. So I think all of that needs to be factored in and we have a really a unique opportunity. Yeah, Bob, I, I would just agree. Thank you for raising this question. I had a great opportunity to collaborate with some epidemiology colleagues last month when they submitted a response to the NCI and NIEHS um, cancer cohort RFA that came out. And I think one of it in their their approach is very much based on environmental disparities and environmental racism. But one of the issues that us environmental folks um, struggled with in helping them was the cost of doing the exposome analysis. Um, you can do sort of a one-by-one -one approach, um, but to really get a, a hold of the full set of environmental exposome characteristics, it became um, cost prohibitive very quickly. So I wonder if there's a way that we can address that or if there's new technologies where that are validated that we can look at more than one or two things at a time in a cost, cost um, neutral way. But what about, um doing a targeted analysis for the chemicals that we already understand, like obesogenic chemicals and fatty liver disease or lead poisoning in kids with ADHD. Just to see, not, not to see that it's a cause, but to see whether or not it makes the disorder worse. Uh, and if it does, then there are potential for treatments that might actually slow the progression or even reverse some of the, the symptoms. Totally agree, Bob. Right. I see that Terry had his hand up next. Uh, thank you all for a wonderful presentation. It was really very insightful and, and fun to, to listen to that. Um, I had two questions, actually. First one has to do with uh, another aspect of sort of precision, and that is uh, single cell molecular phenotyping. And there's a lot of interest in this lately to help uh, enhance, if you will, some of our analyses, um, because maybe, for instance, in blood, it might be happening in just one subset of, of leukocytes that's, um, you know, being in some ways diluted out by doing whole blood sampling, and uh, or spatial transcriptomics. I'm thinking on blood cards might be another thing that would be quite interesting to do from a single cell analysis uh, perspective. So I'd I, I'd appreciate your thoughts on that, and then secondly, for those. People who are doing metabolomics and uh, especially looking at uh, you know the twenty thousand uh, features in your in your mass spec uh, signatures, um, what about diet and dietary factors that might be there that could be not only looked at as correlates but also potential mm, suggestions for interventions? That is, if you see certain things that are there that um, maybe you know with the vegan movement and other kinds of uh, things that people are doing. Uh, might actually give us some insights on how to prevent disease by modifying diets? Well, great questions. So, who'd like to take uh, start off with that? Andrea, do you want to start off? Yep, I, I certainly can start from the metabolomics. Uh, you're completely right. The, the high resolution metabolomics picks up uh, everything that is exogenous. And, and it's organic. I mean, for instance, it doesn't pick up metals or trace elements, but um, diet, smoking, uh, there is lots of variation that uh, people see due to physical activity. So it's really a wide, broad net where you measure lots of um, exogenous uh, exposures. So it, there is a huge opportunity there. And uh, absolutely, I'm sure I remember the first question though. If, if Cheryl and Dana remember that, then you can go well, ahead. I, I was going to say, Terry, you you are dead on. And you know, um, that question five years ago would have had a lot of hand waving. But now single cell, you name the omic, right? 
the single cell RNA seq, single cell attack seq, now single cell cheap chip. I mean, you can you can do it all. And so, for example, if you're interested in pesticides and Parkinson's, you really want to know about the dopaminergic neurons, right? And so, if you're looking at the whole brain, you could miss something really important. And so, I know that you are focused appropriately on thinking about the biomarkers, but also even in terms of understanding the effect, we can do things now that we absolutely couldn't have dreamed of five years ago. I mean, along those lines, I just want to call to everyone's attention the BRAIN initiative across the NIH. If you're not aware of this, uh, please uh, take a look at some of the remarkable data sets that they're generating. And it's not just about sequencing individual cells uh, for, for DNA sequence, but looking at epigenetic modifications in single cells and doing, and doing the expression profiling so you know what kind of cell you're looking at. So I, I wasn't aware of these resources, but I have recently acquainted myself with them. And it's actually pretty amazing. So, okay, we have another question from Trevor. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for such uh, exhilarating um, presentations. I really like the idea of the uh, <clears throat> genome being used as a biosensor for exposure. So Andrea, thank you for that point. I wanna turn it around a little bit though. Um, uh, if you go back in time, uh, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation uh, actually uh, wrote an article in Nature a few years ago about their concept of precision public health. And their idea was that, was that uh, this comes out of their work in, uh, 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 in Africa on, on AIDS and so on. But their point was that precision public health would be to identify those most vulnerable and then take uh, uh, limited resources and focus those limited resources on the most vulnerable. And so, the epigenome component of what you presented is very forward thinking, and it's maybe where we will be several years from now. But um, there's a lot of things we can do in this realm of precision environment health right now, which are actionable. For example, in Philadelphia, we have very granular um, maps of lead soil contamination. And that immediately means that children living in those areas should have their blood lead levels measured. And if they are high, they can go into uh, cognitive behavior programs to improve their cognition. That would be an example of precision environmental health that we can do today. So I think we need to think not only about the future, but actually framing uh, precision environmental health in what we can do that's actionable right now. And I just want to thank you for that, Trevor. And I also want to point out that Trevor, you and Case Elferink were the corresponding authors on that precision environmental health paper that Andrea um, highlighted. So I wanted to say thank you uh, to you for that as well. Yeah. And Trevor, I couldn't agree more. And I, I mentioned when that the precision health should be directed to picking out individuals and, and communities. I think you highlighted the communities very well. Thank you, Andrea. And I think just also highlighting that this is, we wanna be thinking about what we can be doing you know, tomorrow. I mean, today with the existing technologies, kind of applying innovative new ways of looking in communities as well as developing innovative new technologies uh, to address the long-term picture. So we got to keep the entire spectrum of things in, our, in mind as we're planning you know, our research portfolio. And Trevor, those are great comments. Thank so you. I see that Irva has raised her hand. We just have a few minutes left. Irva, you need to uh, unmute. Yeah, I, I had something covering up that corner of my screen. Um, yeah, really great, uh, great presentation, um, all three of them actually. And um, it reminded me a little bit of, of sort of this um, strategy, which we've been starting to follow now in our autism research. And, I, and, and I'm actually not even sure exactly, I feel like it falls into one of those paradigms, either, I don't know whether it's forward or reverse that Cheryl was talking about, or uh, one, of, one of your uh, uh, di directions, Dana, which is in, in autism, um, one of the one of the areas, uh, you know, it's been a lot of genetics and a lot of pathways that have been 
uh, really well characterized uh, related to neuroinflammation. Um, you know, it's very specific, you know, wind pathways, um, uh, sodium channels, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, synapse formation and things like that. And, um, and then we can then take and look and see some of the suspect environmental factors. And we, we find that some of them operate on some of those exact same pathways that uh, really uh, makes very plausible, you know, some of the epidemiologic data, which of course is observational as it almost always is in, in environmental health. And, um, it, you know, it, it seems like that's one of the ways, somebody was saying, well, uh, we were talking a few minutes ago about how expensive the exposome is, but if you, if there is a specific ex, um, disease that you're looking at, uh, we, we often know those pathways and can actually, uh, you know, link up and then narrow that field so that we're not trying to do the full exposome, but we're, we're, we can do something more targeted. There are classes of, of compounds that really fall into, into, the, into the pathways and that the genetics can actually feed into um, the strategies for uh, honing in on which environmental chemicals um, are, are, are the most um, toxic and, and likely to be causal. I, I, I think that it, it, it's sort of building <laughs> out, of, out of some of that. Yeah, anyway. Great comments. Any, any comments, Michelle, Dana, or Andrea? Yeah, thanks, Irva. This, this is Dana. I, I think that, that, that what I tried to show fits in nicely with Cheryl's reverse um, and forward translation, because if you anchor it on, let's just say epigenetics as um, the biomarker, it could be a biomarker for past exposure. And we don't even really need to necessarily measure all the past exposures that predicts future disease risk. Um, and so that way you, you can simplify a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, I think a, a sort of another question that is forward thinking is, is sort of what we've alluded to this and, and Trevor did too, what, what would you do about that um, if you identified an epigenetic predictor? of a future disease risk. Um, you can do interventions like, for example, with the lead getting into, cog into cognitive behavioral theory, but are we at a place now where we can begin to think about intervening on the epigenomic or genomic level? And that's something that, that Cheryl and Andre and I didn't get into today, but um, you know, there are epigenetic therapies for certain types of diseases, um, including cancer. But the data I showed today on you know, predicting infant, um, predicting childhood obesity from the neonatal blood spots, is, is that something that we'd even wanna consider um, thinking about um, identifying genomic or epigenomic interventions or putting it on, on a path to other sorts of interventions as well? So I think there's a lot of bioethical things to begin to consider, consider in both the sort of future direction and in the past direction of thinking about how to mitigate environmental exposures from the get-go. I think this actually brings us back to Marla's point uh, quite a bit earlier in the morning. Well, my morning, your afternoon, I guess, um, uh, uh, about really research that can bring us to policy and action and, um, and, and mitigation and uh, reduction of risk. Yeah. Well, sounds good. And I see that we're just about at time. So um, I'm going to thank Cheryl, Dana, and Andrea for your presentations today. And just uh, make a parting comment that, uh, in fact, part of the reason why I was talking to Cheryl many months ago on this topic is that, you know, the, the other ICs and so much of the rest of the world is really focusing on the genetics and the genomics of common disease and the things that are happening to human health. And I think part of our responsibility as environmental health sciences is to get the tools and the types of approaches that we just heard from Cheryl, Dana, and Andrea we need to get this deployed. We need to have more intersections with the genetics and the genomics folks, because if we're ever going to be ever imagining that precision medicine is gonna work, you know, clearly we've got to start factoring these environmental exposures into the equation. Because the, and, and Andrea's uh, slide where you're showing that, you know, a large percentage of human adverse health effects are likely to be attributable to environmental exposures. So we've got to work on those, those mechanisms to get better intersections. And I, I will continue to work with all of you and 
Um, and as Lynn Goldman mentioned, I'll go do my role as a scientific statesmanship uh, to try to spread the word and, uh, and you know, hopefully develop better collaborations with other ICs. So thanks again to the three of you for joining us today. And Thank thanks everyone. And thanks everyone for your interest and your, your questions. So we should go now into our break. And uh, so we've got 15 minutes and we will be back right at 12.30. And Tara Schwetz is going to be telling us about some of the really exciting things that are happening in Building One and across the NIH around the issues of anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Cheryl, Dana, and Andrea, if you're interested, you know, stay on. <laughs> okay, otherwise, <laughs> good, goodbye. And Cheryl, good luck with the electricity and, and other things and getting the snow off the streets in Houston. Getting colder and colder here right now. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Where are you gonna have to go generate some hot data to keep yes. yourself up? <laughs> bye, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, Thank bye you. everyone. So we'll see you back. Uh, Pat, do you want to make any comments before we go on the official break? Nope, we'll see you in 15. Okay, 15 minutes sharp. Okay, Thanks. bye.